trailers have been around almost as long as the film industry itself. Little bits of eye candy made to try and get you into the theater to see whatever crap they're peddling. Sometimes trailers are events in and of themselves, but most of the time they're just time-wasting burdens before you watch that Nicki Minaj video for the 40th time. Most of them fall by the wayside and are forgotten because of their lack of originality or just because it's a bad movie. But those rare few have that special something that burrows into your memory in a very short amount of time and fashions itself a comfy little nook between your temporal and parietal lobes. And these are five of them. Five trailers worth mentioning. One million years BC bills itself as being filled to the brim with fascinating, strange, and fearful creatures, like the Brontosaurus, the Pterodactyl, the Triceratops, and a Warthog. This trailer stands out right from the start because it has a narrator that makes the movie seem like the event of the century. He delivers his lines in a melodramatic way and with such conviction that I just can't help but wonder what this guy must have looked like while reading them in the recording booth. One million years B.C. erupts on the screen with volcanic excitement. One million years B.C. when the earth parted and the mountains fell. See the fascinating, strange, and fearful creatures who roamed and ruled the earth a million years B.C. The Brontosaurus, a moving mountain of flesh and bone. You will share the unending thrills and excitement of a world of primitive wonders primeval terror and savagery. You will indeed live in another world, in another time, as the centuries fall back to reveal the Earth one million years B.C. But beyond the narrator, this is one of the films using claymation dinosaurs created by stop-motion pioneer Ray Harryhausen. <gasps> Harryhausen? Yeah, that guy. Not only was he revolutionary for his stop-motion animation, but also for how he blended it with live-action footage. A shot like this, for instance. Live action guy with a stop motion arm spearing an Allosaurus. Quick cut. Clay arm is gone. I just like to study these kinds of movies and try to figure out how they were able to pull off effects that were really cutting edge at the time. But don't get me wrong, there are still some of those often mocked human jabbing at the air shots that never looked convincing. And then there are those kinds of shots where people are just running in front of a rear projection. Sometimes it blends seamlessly with the foreground, sometimes not so much. Not since time began has the primitive scene been captured for the screen with such imaginative realism. Imaginative realism is just a precursor to based on actual events. And when you base movies off of actual events, you end up with sludge oozing from the toilet and a house with a menstrual cycle. But in this movie's case, imaginative realism means that you get selectively clothed Neanderthals with exquisitely white teeth. Huh. I guess dentistry is the only thing older than the wheel. Right away, you can tell something's wrong with the back of this lady's head, because the shoulders never move, and if you work out where the elbow joints would be, you'll see that she's basically a praying mantis. Admittedly, it's a pretty difficult effect to pull off convincingly, but... I just love the idea of a primping and preening praying mantis wearing a wig and turtleneck. The movie is set in a house that's overrun with unadulterated evil. Lights flicker, wind blows, the wallpaper is torn to shreds, and cloaked strangers graze your face with sharp objects. It's a terror so intense that she breaks not one pane of glass, but both. Because they made two pieces of breakable glass, and damn it, they're gonna get their money's worth. I think of this scene every time I look out a darkened window. You know, those times when you press your face to the glass and strain your eyes to make out what's outside? Now that's how you do the Jody's glowing eyes jump scare in the Amityville Horror right. No shots of Margot Kidder laughing at the ridiculous pig prop they used. The only thing more terrifying than the last 12 minutes of Suspiria are the first 92. And they cap off the trailer by indirectly saying that the movie has a relatively weak ending. This one starts by reminding us that New Line Cinema used to have a seizure logo. Besides that, I like this one because it's simple yet effective, and a good example of less definitely being more. It's just a shot of a teenage girl holding the popsicle stick replica of 1428 Elm Street, but it's a scene that's not from the movie. They just have some blonde extra in place of Patricia Arquette, and all she does is sit there and rock, but it works for some reason. Despite the questions that are raised by a teenage girl having a tricycle beside her bed, there's really no reason for it other than just for visual effect. 
She's humming that familiar hypnotic tune and being accompanied by what sounds like either a little piano or something obscure like a clavichord. There's so little going on with this trailer that you even have time to notice the subtle details, like seeing the popsicle house wobble a bit as a crew member gets in position for... Nine, ten... The Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. Freddy's just around the corner. And it ends with a synthesizer crescendoing in a symphony of horror, sweetening it to a phrase of such delight. It's that kind of bellicose music you can imagine bitterly pouring from the Phantom's organ, and the less said about what pours from the Phantom's organ, the better. On a June night in 1980, Friday the 13th, 12 of her friends were murdered. Why should Friday the 13th 1981 be any different. It's very unlikely that this Friday the 13th could be the same considering that there were three in 1981, none of which were in May, the month in which the film was released. All that line accomplishes is that it makes Jason look like a killer with really inconsistent goals. He tries to murder people in February and March, then he takes an eight month sabbatical to do God knows what. I'm just going to assume that he took the time to recuperate and ice his knees, maybe get a certification in something useful like heating and air conditioning repair. Then he's rested and ready to go in November. Besides that, I like to think of this trailer as the abridged version of the movie, mostly because they count about every murder and jump scare in order. It's a perfect example of when you see all the good stuff before you even enter the theater, so you already have an idea of who's gonna die. All doomed. You're all doomed. They aren't doomed, crazy old guy, but you are. 23. Why even bother going to see it? But before all that, this trailer starts with a masked mystery killer, and it's soon revealed to be an adult Jason. That's gotta be misleading to people who at the time only knew Jason as a deformed kid. Apparently after his death in the 50s, he was frozen at age 10 for 30 years, but once he popped out of the water he started aging again? Screw the fountain of youth, just go swimming in Crystal Lake. With your clothes on, of course. Apparently Jason doesn't like that kind of thing. You are seeing scenes from the next motion picture to play this theater. This is Adam, and this is a story of Adam and evil. Which honestly sounds like a better title than the one they went with. You must keep reminding yourself, it's just a movie. It's just a movie. It's just a movie. Oh man, does this guy ever instill excitement in me? He's given some dialogue that even the guy from One Million Years BC couldn't make sound interesting. To his credit, it was 1965 and they hadn't really perfected the slasher horror trailer yet. The trend was just starting and apparently they thought that monotonous narration over disoriented bloody people was enough to bring in the crowds. Plus color was a big gimmick back then so, ooh, look at all the red and yellow. Such imaginative realism as someone spills paint over a burning mattress. Color me blood red. Color me blood red. Color me blood red. Red. And the guy really beats the title into your head to make sure that you remember, like they did with Head On. And you know what? It must work because I can still remember that damn product. And then it must be applied directly to the forehead. This is a film drenched in crimson. A blood spattered study in the macabre. <sighs> I'm sorry, but I just can't get past this guy's low level of energy. And I thought I was bad. Can you imagine how out of place this guy would be in the current year? You are looking at scenes from the next movie to debut on Blu-ray or a streamable platform. Hey babe, I figured we could shotgun a few beers before having sex in the grave of that sorcerer that died 200 years ago tonight. Babe? Ah! Jump scare movie number 4092. Jump scare movie number 4092. Jump scare movie number 4092. You guessed it. It's literally nothing but jump scares. No originality, no plot, and no attempt at building tension. Just lots of awkward, lopsided shots and jarring noises every five minutes. This test audience thought it was scary, but what we forgot to mention is that they're actually watching Bland Romantic Comedy number 9060. It's really that bad these days. We've cherry-picked some tweets that actually help make this movie look watchable. Jump Scare Movie Number 4092 The only thing more predictable than the last 10 minutes are the first 74.